This is a Carlo lunchtime presentation. It's also on the forum. And we also have co-sponsorship from uh, the Second Language Education Program and the Young Instruction Department in CHD. Um, I am so happy to introduce Teresa Gillison. Um, and she is a new graduate of the MA TESOL program. Um, Elaine Jerome is the one that told me to have all of these new graduates come and do their presentation. Mm -hmm. They did so much work. And it's really a great opportunity for those of you who are still in the pipeline to see what's coming ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and Teresa is also teaching in a multi program as an adjunct teaching specialist. And she is going to talk about Collaborative revitalization, negotiating pronunciation, grammar, and Ojibwe. Great. All right, so hi everybody. Thanks for coming to my presentation. Awesome turnout today. And like she said, if you've forgotten already, I think most of you already know me, but I'm Teresa Gillison. <laughs> just got out of the, the master's program, so just starting out at MELP. All right, and today I'm going to be talking about indigenous language revitalization. I think a lot of you probably know what that is already, but just a little recap. It's the, the movement that is actively trying to bring indigenous languages back into use. It's very specifically not just language documentation, and it's not just language preservation, but it's really the active effort to get people to use the language in their everyday life and pass it also on to the next generation. Right? And my specific presentation is on Ojibwe, and it's specifically on collaboration. So collaboration while revitalizing the Ojibwe language, and it's specifically even more on pronunciation and grammar, right? So since I know most of you and you're all language lovers and language teachers, I thought we would start with a tiny bit of language, right? So we make our students do this all the time in class, so I'm going to have you repeat after me, all right? So, Buju. Very good. All right, so that's hello. Buju. Good. All right. I think you guys are ready for a little bit more. This is a little more complicated. All right, so this first word is gamino. Ayana. Gamino ayana. Gamino ayana. Good. All right. So that is how are you or are you good? All right. And one more. The answer? Niminoaya. Very good. You guys know your first conversation in Ojibwe, all right? So if I say buju, you say? Buju. Aha. Geminoayana. Niminoaya. Niminoaya. Very good. All right, Gegets. You guys are now officially part of the language revitalization movement, all right? You're in here. You can't leave now. All right, and I want to tell you a little bit about why that movement is here and what it is, right? So right now, Ojibwe is at about a seven on the language status scale, and that scale just measures sort of the health of a language. So since it's at a seven, that means that there's an effort right now to bring it back into use. So it's being put into immersion schools, there are, they're teaching children, people are trying to learn it, but it's still mostly being spoken by the older generation. So in Ojibwe's case, it's mostly being spoken by tribal elders. And as with any revitalization effort, there are a lot of difficulties. So any time that you're trying to bring back a language, you have trouble with the number of native speakers, right? Every year, there are fewer people who grew up speaking Ojibwe. And that's because of a very, very long history of very calculated oppression of the language. It was actively stifled for children and adults. And of course, for the same reason, fewer native speakers means fewer people to teach. And specifically, there's trouble finding people who have both the skills with teaching and with the language who are able to handle a job like an immersion classroom, for example. It's a very specific skill set. I think with indigenous language revitalization, it's even a step farther because not only are those things problems, but also the lack of materials. So this is getting better, right? We have Mel here, she works a lot on creating materials. We have Mary Hermes, she's done a lot of things with creating materials for schools. 
we have the Ojibwe People's Dictionary. Every year we have more. But it's never going to be like if you want to learn Spanish and you have a question, you just Google it, right? Not the same thing here. And especially that's true because of this really awesome oral tradition that Ojibwe has. There was not always a written language. In fact, there's very little evidence that there was a right, uh, written language at all until they were colonized. So the first things that were written in Ojibwe were translations of the Bible. So you get that really sort of menacing thing where the thing being used to revitalize language is the thing that first stifled the language. So there's that, right? And then just so that you have a little bit of background, there are three basic approaches that people generally take when learning Ojibwe. So the biggest one is master apprentice, where someone who is a tribal elder usually pairs with someone from the community who wants to learn. And the, the, it's the master's job to speak normally at the apprentice, not at a lower level, just normal. And the apprentice is supposed to just passively take in the language and learn it that way. There's not much speaking involved. Cultural ceremonies. So some people learn Ojibwe to participate in cultural ceremonies, which usually means memorizing a chunk of language and performing it. And then book learning, of course, you're more familiar with. You learn on your own with a book, maybe with a teacher. And the thing to notice about these three approaches is that they tend to be very passive. So it's sort of an Ojibwe tradition of passive learning. So you don't assume that you know anything. It's better to listen and learn from someone who does. So that's a little bit a part of the culture. All right. So how did we get into this project? I actually have Maria here. She was in my class. I was in a Mary Hermes language revitalization class, which is fantastic, those of you who are still in your second year. Um, we started learning a little bit of Ojibwe language a few minutes at a time as sort of a language appreciation before class. It wasn't really specific instruction. We'd learn a couple of words and sort of do a TPR game at the beginning of class. But Rosalind and I decided that that wasn't enough and that as part of our final project, we were going to learn as much Ojibwe as we could in 11 weeks, which turned out to be a much bigger undertaking than we expected, as you will see. But I, um, so we started at about two weeks, and then at seven weeks, I did the recording for this study, and then we went for 11 total weeks. Just so that you have a little taste of what we started out as, I have a little video that was us in week two. I've added subtitles to help you out. See if you recognize any of the words. That's enough of that, I think. <laughs> oh. All right. All right. So as you can see, we, we struggled a lot, but we had a lot of fun while doing it. And the process of our little meetings was actually the most interesting part of the whole thing for me. So those meetings where we had a lot of fun, we made a lot of mistakes, was what I started thinking about when I started thinking about a research question. So the biggest thing that I wanted to know was, as two very novice learners, could we even pull this off? Or were we going to be a total tra train wreck with this poor, poor language, right? So the first thing I wanted to know was, could we even monitor each other's mistakes? Could we catch each other's mistakes and give each other feedback on them, right? And if we could do that, the second thing I wanted to know is, 
when we gave feedback, would we notice and would there be uptake? Right? So could we even manage to correct each other? And then when we corrected each other, would we actually learn anything? Right. And so you need to know a little bit, a tiny bit about us before I begin. So I'm pretty, pretty easy here. I was 26, a graduate student, zero previous experience with Ojibwe or any of that. But I did know, I am a language teacher, and I did know Spanish before this. And uh, at the time of the study, I had done about 24.5 hours of studying. Rosalind's a little bit more interesting. She's also 28 and white, but she spent a good chunk of her childhood on an Ojibwe reservation. She went to school on a reservation, and she actually took Ojibwe classes for a number of years sporadically. I think her experience was a lot like we had as children, just sort of a foreign language Ojibwe experience. Um, again, studied seven weeks, and at the time of the study, she had, was a little bit more studious than me. She had done 31.5 hours approximately. All right, And I needed to create a task to sort of distract us from the, the grammar so we wouldn't be thinking about it, and this is what we set up. So we had just learned weather vocabulary, and we had just learned how to make things in the future and in the past. So we came up with this thing where uh, we each got a piece of paper like this with three words. This is yesterday, bijinago, today, nungam, and tomorrow, wabang. And um, we took turns drawing weather phenomena into each of those boxes without showing the other person. The other person had to ask us questions until they could figure out and draw the same pictures in these boxes. We were somewhat successful. Right. And down to what I found. So I uh, split this into pronunciation and grammar. And in pronunciation, I ended up focusing on just one word because there were so many instances of this one word, which was nungam, which was today. So we had said this word a number of times. I think before this happened, we had said the word, she had said it six times correctly, and I had said it four times correctly. But then all of a sudden, Rosalind comes up with, instead of saying nungam, she said nugam. Okay? So anytime, so on this gloss, it's the first line is Ojibwe, second line is the gloss, and third line is English. And if you see a star, that means that the word is pronounced incorrectly. So this was at the end of the first segment when we were correcting our answers. So that's why it's a little bit strange, but this is how it went. Yesterday, good. Today, Rosalind says it incorrectly. Okay? I immediately recast her and say, today. But I just continue on with what I'm doing. Today, it is snowing. And she replies to, with, it is snowing and cold, it is cold. All right. So here, she does not notice my recast, or she completely ignores it. One of the two. I'm guessing that since it's the very end of the transcript, and you can see Rosalind actually used English in her Ojibwe, I suspect that she thought the task was over, and this was her just being like, whatever, who needs pronunciation, right? I don't think she was ignoring me. I think she just didn't notice this recast. But it happens later, okay? So we have, uh, today, pronounced incorrectly again. How is the weather today? Is it, right? is it cloudy? Is it cloudy today? This time I'm very clear, right? I go, today? And she notices this time. It's in isolation. She notices my recast and says, today. So this time, yes, we have success. I've recasted her, and she notices, and there is uptake. And then a final, I think, one here. Unfortunately, as we all know as uh, language teachers, just because you get it right once does not mean you will get it right right away again. Right? And here it is. So here's the end of the second segment, and Rosalind says, no, today it will get windy, it will get windy tonight, tomorrow. What will the weather be like tomorrow? All right, and I, this time, don't even recast her. I say, it is snowing, it will snow tomorrow. And I don't think I've given up on her, right? I haven't given up on her getting it right. I think what's happening here is she had just produced by far the most complicated sentence in the entire two segments. She included a WH question, which I had not even learned yet. 
She included Get Windy, which I had just barely learned, and she was really focused on getting those things right, and I was just focused on trying to get this task done. Right? So she uh, got the thing wrong again, I didn't correct her, I was just holding on, right? holding on for dear life. So, so far we have uh, a recast that's ignored, but then a recast that's taken up, and now no recast. Right? But that brings us to grammar. And this is, my, this is my favorite example from my whole paper, because I think it really shows the negotiation that went on for grammar here. So we're starting with Rosalind again. And we had just learned negation, but we had just recently learned uh, past tense. And that's what we're negotiating for here. She says, it isn't sun, it is sunny yesterday. So here she's missing the past tense marker. And in Ojibwe, you mark the past tense with an affix. So she needs to say gi, and she's missed it. I didn't notice. I say, yes, it is sunny yesterday. Okay. But then through hearing me get it wrong, Rosalind's like, oh, okay, now I hear the error. But she can't quite fix it yet. She doesn't have that quite ready yet. So instead, she just says this affix over and over. She says, gi, 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 so past, past, past. And I go, oh, shoot, we're messing up past tense. But I can't fix it right away either. And I go, past. It continues. <laughs> <laughs> Rosalind gets part of it right now. It was sun, not quite, past, past, past. And then I put it all together. It was sunny yesterday. And she repeats, it was sunny yesterday. Okay. So I think this is my clearest evidence of really building that knowledge together, which I think is something that we've all seen in classes and while learning languages. All right. And last grammar example here, all right, we had just finished the previous drawing. So Rosalind said, it was sunny yesterday. I agree. Okay. Rosalind says, oh, uh, okay, it is cold yesterday. And I say, it is cold. I notice that there's something wrong there, right? It is cold yesterday. Shoot, that's what we were doing before. It is cold. All right. Again, through hearing me do it wrong, now Rosalind gets it, right? She says, it is cold, yes, it was cold. It was cold. And what happens here is I still don't get it. So, ah, no, it is not cold yesterday, it is hot. Okay, shoot. But I noticed that this is sort of a special case in my data. Uh, when I went through it with Elaine, we noticed that there was never once in this entire two segments that we got past tense and negation right at the same time. <laughs> and we, we suspect that it's some sort of order of acquisition that's happening here. We're not quite right to get those at the same time yet. We have to get the past tense first, and then we can get that negation in there. Right? But even though I don't get it, Rosalind comes back and she gets it. It was hot. It was hot yesterday. So she's able to do it when there's no negation involved, right? So you may have noticed that there are quite a few limitations in this study. The most glaring one, we are both white researchers at a university, right? We were surprised why immediately when taking on this Ojibwe language, how much responsibility and guilt we felt when we weren't studying what we felt like was enough but there's no way we could ever know the full extent of what that feels like for someone who is Ojibwe, right? Feeling the responsibility of holding up your ancestral language or else, right? We're also language teachers. So we were able to go online, find the few resources and figure them out. Because we un when we heard something like Ojibwe is an agglutinating language that relies on suffixes and affixes and prefixes, we were like, okay, but if you haven't learned a language before, if you're not a language teacher, haven't studied linguistics, that would be really terrifying and difficult to figure out. Also, language learners, we were not afraid of making mistakes at all. Throughout our, throughout our videos, they're all us laughing about our mistakes. But there's a major cultural belief in the Ojibwe culture that making mistakes is pretty taboo. It, it feels like you're you're not respecting the ancestral language, and it's really 
because of that emphasis on passive learning and taking in knowledge from people who are your elders, it's not as okay to make mistakes, which is something that is a major limitation here. Also, resources that we had, right? We're in the university setting. We had some access to people who were higher level second language learners, and the sample was a little less than seven minutes of video. So, major limitations. However, I think that, there is, I think that the major thing that came out of this was, was hope. Right? So this is a language that has fewer and fewer native speakers every year. But if you look at my research question, first, we were very clearly able to pick out the errors in each other's language if we were ready for them. We were able to pick out each other's errors and correct them, and there was some pretty clear uptake in some of these examples, right? We were able to do one and two. And in this language that has fewer speakers every year, I think that gives a lot of hope for second language learners being able to carry this language. We are able to co-construct the language together, and I think that's a lot better than learning language by yourself. Um, not only that, but I think that learn, learning language with busy lives is really hard. I know that um, learning language with Rosalind was much easier, and it gave me really a lot of motivation to study. We were both pretty busy at the time. We were full-time students. We had more than full-time appointments. But those meetings were really, not only gave us a sense of support in studying, but also helped us deal with some of that guilt we were feeling over not studying as much as we thought we should, right? And finally, let's see, incorporating uh, collaborative learning and traditional approaches. So during my defense, Martha Bigelow came up with this great idea of this being apprentice-apprentice approach instead of master-apprentice. And I think that's really important because it sort of gets away from that, I'm afraid to make mistakes in front of someone who knows this language better than me, right? It is apprentice-apprentice. We're building this knowledge together. And it also touches on the idea uh, of this fear of mistakes, right? We can both make mistakes together. And then the finally, final thing that I touched on in my paper was purity versus vitality of the language. There's a lot of fear uh, that second language learners will somehow ruin the language, but they're also, you know, healthy languages change. And I think that second language learners can bring a healthy change into a language. And I don't think that a language has to stay the same forever to be a really healthy language. All right, that's all I've got. That's, oh wait, no, I don't, I'm sorry. How'd it turn out, right? <laughs> How did it turn out? So I picked a, a video that was very similar to the one that I showed you in the beginning. It's similar sort of topic here, introductions. And I'll show you part of it. enthusiastic about the props <laughs> all right so I think you can very clearly say see we were not perfect 
But we learned quite a bit by the end of the semester, especially in just 11 weeks of practice with whenever we had time. So together we were able to learn quite a bit of Ojibwe. All right, so miigwech, thank you so much for coming. And if you, do you guys have any questions for me? No, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So I think, oh man, it's been a while since I've looked at the language scale, but I think one down is that there's not a concerted effort to revitalize it. It's still, we're still doing okay, right? It's not a dead language yet. There's a lot of hope for Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a really vital language would be a... Uh, one? I'll have to check on that for you. Yeah. Mel, do you know? Yeah. Yeah, tell me. So, I mean, one is the most, most final. Yes. Dead. Yes. Right. So we're, so we're okay yet. Like golf. We're like golf. You mentioned that um, uh, Rosalind, uh, Rosalind um, didn't pronounce uh, the word for today correctly. And, and, um, I was just kind of wondering, who's, who's the judge? <laughs> we had uh, learned that one from Mary Hermes. Yeah. So there were a couple of words that we are, I mean, actually, Ojibwe is pretty easy to know how to pronounce things because the, the writing system makes a lot of sense. It's the double vowel system. So I think each, uh, each um, letter only has one sound. So that was actually OK. We are usually able to figure out how to say things, but if we had doubts, we'd ask Mary Hermes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a question kind of along those same lines too, because um, you, I mean, I like the apprentice apprentice mm -hmm. as like a sort of a contrast with the master apprentice. Yeah. Um, and you sort of characterize that in the beginning as being more of a passive approach, but my understanding is that it's actually pretty active, that you're negotiating for meaning in the target language the whole time, kind of like what you and Rosalind were doing. And I wonder if you could um, just say a little bit more about like how apprentice apprentice and master apprentice kind of line up, especially for instances of error correction where if it's a master apprentice, if, master apprentice the, if the master recasts, mm -hmm. maybe you're more likely to be, to be mm -hmm. noticing than if the apprentice is recasting, because like I'm in my English classes all the time, I doubt, you know, like, I doubt myself, and then I doubt my colleagues, and then I doubt my colleagues, yeah. You can actually see a little bit of, I think there are a couple of um, instances in my data where you could, you could argue, I actually thought about doing my paper from this point of view for a while, you could argue that Rosalind was ignoring my recast. Yeah, that's exactly what I yeah, so that would be like an apprentice-apprentice thing that's different from master apprentice. Yes. So I've thought a little bit about that. The way I understand master-apprentice is that, of course, there's negotiation because you have two people talking to each other one-on-one. -on -one. But um, more than this, it's in the beginning, it's a little bit submersive. Yeah. So it's much above the language learner's ability to understand. Yeah. So I imagine towards the end, it's a wonderful, wonderful setup, right? Yeah. But it, oh, <laughs> Elaine's jumping in. But there, there is also that, that element of, of submersion. Yeah, I think the language is not modified as much by the master as the teacher. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think early on, we talked about the, the difference in proficiency you guys felt between each other. Yeah. yeah. Because, because Rosalind grew up in Kansas. Yeah, 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 so yeah. there was some feeling that Rosalind could ignore your recast, uh -huh. but you were more likely yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I wanted to do that, but it's kind of hard to prove our language levels. Neither of us have taken like an Ojibwe proficiency yeah. test. So I decided not to go that way, but the, the data is actually pretty interesting if you look at it that way. And if you think about schools too, where, because maybe even if you didn't take a test, but just if you both perceive that she's going to be better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think about it like families where like if maybe one family mm -hmm. has a ceremony back then, another doesn't. Mm -hmm. Like there's their just perception shapes is that I mean, yeah it's, really it's perception mutual yeah. perception is more important than measures yeah yeah i would argue is if you both agree she's proficient yeah. that's what matters and I think that was fairly clear the whole time. <laughs> it was fairly clear. She took on a little bit of a teacher role. And she, I think she felt more of the guilt, too, because she had had this in her past. She spent much more time studying than I did. Yeah. Yeah. And 
your examples, it seemed like usually at least one of you noticed the error. Mm -hmm. Did you find many examples of errors where neither of you noticed or you just kept? Yeah, so definitely, especially in that one that I m briefly mentioned with negation and past mm -hmm. or at a tense at the same time. We never got it right. We never noticed. We would notice the, pa the, the tense, but not the negation. So yes, but I just don't think we were ready to notice that yet. We hadn't put much time into negation. We had just learned it, and we had to get down the past tense first before we could move on to that. But yes, that did happen. Mm -hmm. Usually just with those two things, because our language was so limited at that point that those were the only things we knew how to do. <laughs> So it was pretty limited, but yes, yeah. I was just kind of wondering about the conditions that lead to you guys negotiating and giving each other the corrective feedback, like very specific on grammar and pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you need to have the tasks very well scaffolded, and, but you also, of course, you're both language teachers. Um, because I'm, work, I'm kind of doing a similar project with a colleague, um, a mystic. Mm -hmm. And I think we barely give each other corrective feedback. And I think some of the reasons might be, well, we are not designing the tasks in such a way that allows it, and our attention is not drawn to form, like focusing on grammar, pronunciation. And she also um, knows a different variety of the language. So very often I don't even know if she's saying it right or not. It's just mm -hmm. like, do I understand it or do I not understand it? Mm -hmm. And all our negotiation just really focuses on comprehension. Mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, but there's no recast. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that had a lot to do with the task and how we set it up. We set it up in a way that we needed to know past tense, future tense, and uh, positive negative in order to be able to draw the picture correctly. So I think, yeah, I think I would have been much more likely to ignore the things she was saying if I didn't need them to draw my picture at the end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it might be partly just the setting up the tasks so that the, the information is something that you need and not just, you know, grammar. Yeah, Lynn? I think, too, it, it would be nice to see a lot of discussion about this issue of accuracy mm -hmm. and the and the importance of accuracy in preserving the language in the minds of the learner. You know, I think there's a tendency in general for learners of all languages to worry about being accurate. But it's harder when the outcome of your own language learning process is saving a whole language and culture, right? So how that works when you're an Ojibwe learner is collaborative learning possible under those circumstances? I think it adds a weight to um, trying to avoid error at all costs rather than living with error and getting it corrected and, and negotiating. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd say something about that. Maybe learning through interaction is a Western thing for Western languages. Yeah, so what, what is the, what point well, do you The question is, what, is this, would this work? Would this work with uh, Ojibwe people trying to revitalize their own language? Super good question. That was by far my biggest limitation, right? Mm -hmm. We had stock in the language. We didn't realize in the beginning how much stock we had, but mm -hmm. we did not have that. Mm -hmm. right? We did not have, if we get this wrong, it's going to be wrong forever. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, I would love to see this done with Ojibwe people. Mm -hmm. um, and to see what would come of that, because the stakes are certainly higher for them. Yeah. Yeah. You probably know about the Ojibwe school, uh, about like Lex. Uh, which one is that? Well, it's called Neashing. Yep. Um, do you know what they do with the language there? Mel would probably be more likely to know the answer. Yeah. I'm not sure. Is that an immersion school? Uh, when I was there, uh, I mean, of course I was there with a bunch of Japanese people, so, <laughs> so we, were, we were interacting in English with everybody there. But I don't remember language as being a big part of what we observed. We observed, uh, you know, passing out certain traditions and stuff, uh, important cultural stuff, but I just don't remember the language being a piece of it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
in an obvious way. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are some language immersion schools, but a lot of them, like, like Rosalind's experience, it's almost like a foreign language taught separately as a class. So I'm not sure exactly how it's done there, but yeah, yeah. Kind of the same vein what Elaine was saying, do you, do you expect there to be like cultural pushback of like even this kind of idea? Yeah. Like she was saying Western as in, obviously it's not. <laughs> and, and like the way that we think of learning language as being oh. like, this is not the way we do it. Yeah, and especially the way we think about learning language, I, I realized that, or I heard through, I think it was Elaine's experience, that um, Ojibwe people believe that language is inside of you and that you've lost it, right? But it's still there and you need to find it. So even just the, the idea of calling Ojibwe a second language is extremely controversial. This whole thing is very controversial. Yes. <laughs> so there would um, definitely be cultural pushback. And I think that researchers have, that's, that's something you have to have activist research and you have to involve the community in your research because otherwise, what is it for, right? Yeah. I mean, in a way, maybe you could try using a different metaphor. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's in there and it's coming to maturation, it's sort of like like gestation, right? Mm -hmm. So, so maybe maybe viewing it as midwifing each other's birth. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, a different metaphor mm -hmm. might, in which you can still help each other. Mm -hmm. and you don't expect the baby to walk, right? So just trying to think, what would be a metaphor that would be culturally resonant that would work for people to understand the process they're going through? Yeah, I mean, it does feel like that, right? In that example where we're going back and forth with past tense, past tense, past, 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 where it almost feels like when you're collaborating with someone like that, you're pulling it out of each other, right? You're, you're building it together, and you could see it as coming from within, right? And again, maturation of, <laughs> of your language happening just together. It can certainly, it, it could certainly be viewed that way. Yes. Other things? Yeah. Did you ever go over the data with Rosalind and ask her, like, what were you thinking then? Not that everybody can always remember what yeah. you were doing, but it seemed like you were not clear about whether she was ignoring you or not. <laughs> Yes, in, in most cases I, I got her point of view on it. A couple of times she did not remember. Yeah, we we're too worried about drawing snowmen and suns. <laughs> but yes, I did go over it with, with her. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember the words we, we learned at the beginning? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't know there would be a test. <laughs> Buju, right? Buju. Gimeno Ayana. Gamino Ayana. Aha, Namino Aya. You were ahead of us. Yeah. Good job. Gay <laughs> get. All right. I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. Giggle Wabaman. Wabam. Mm-hmm. Wabam. Wabaman, yeah. I never thought about that. Okay, go Wabaman. <laughs> Eric just pointed that out. I never thought about it before. Probably. Wabam. <laughs>